And Phil McCoy, who joins us this morning via telephone. Philip, good morning to you. Good morning, guys. How are you all? I am well. I'm, let me tell you how anticipated this segment is. Uh, Dylan already has his headsets on. He's he's already ready to chime in on this one because <laughs> this is the first smile he's cracked all day, Woo! by the way, when I said that. He came in here looking like someone killed his dog. <laughs> I noticed and, he wasn't too talkative when he answered the phone when no. I called in. And Nick Verzellini was- did his sports cast like there was a gun being held to his head. It, he was just – I could hear the tears in Nick's voice doing his sports cast this morning. You know, I feel bad for him. I, it's been a long time since I've been – in the position where they are, where the Steelers are playing for an AFC championship game. But I can't say that even, you know, I was, I was distracted while, while that game was going on, but I was keeping up with the score and I got to listen to the fourth quarter on the way home. And I'd be lying if I didn't tell you it made my way, it made my drive home a little bit easier that the, that the Ravens absolutely choked it away at home in the AFC championship game. It did, it did make that drive a little bit easier. All right, Dylan, go ahead, buddy. It's days like today that make me realize that John Gilstrap is the smartest man in the room. Because <laughs> <laughs> he does, doesn't pay attention to sports, can't get his heart broken. Why do we do this to ourselves? I know. Why do we do this? <laughs> Dylan, that was a great line. <laughs> the, the odds are that you were going to come on and blame the referees. Now, if I was to place money on your first line, it would have been about referees. But instead, you played the, uh, the Gilstrap card, which I admire. I mean, uh, I thought... Yeah, they should have called the pass interference on the the throw that ended up as an interception. But, I mean, Lamar threw it into triple coverage, so it's not like you really really earned that one. I just thought the offense played terrible, just all, all around. It wasn't it wasn't Lamar. It wasn't the play calling. It wasn't the running backs, wide receivers. It was it was all of it. It was really the, the defense did their part to, to hold Mahomes. It, the, the Chiefs did nothing but punt in the second half, and they had plenty of chances. There was just – the inexperience, really. Zay Flowers had his rookie moments in the exact wrong times. It was, you know, I love Lamar Jackson. He has his faults. I don't think it's just, you know, oh, he can't get it done in the playoffs sort of thing. I think there's, it's just a whole team effort sort of thing. I think he could have ran the ball more. He could have hit some more deep passes. But that was just all around just bad offense. I thought uh, the maturity between the two teams in that situation – really showed in that game in in a game like that it's how you keep your frustrations under wraps and how do you not make crucial mistakes in a big game and the mature teams who've been there like the Chiefs have six straight years know how to play in those games in the Ravens who are up and coming when it comes to getting to conference championship games you have to learn the hard way sometimes and, and that's the way you learn is by Self imploding in a big game like that at home. And that, it's hard to watch that game and not say that the Ravens self imploded on that one. Yeah, an example of that was when the defensive tackle went offside. If he'd gone offside, that would have been to the Ravens' advantage. But he made a personal foul out of it as well. Yeah. That cost him. He drilled the minutes. offensive yeah. lineman. Yeah. Phil, I know it made your day. Uh, it did. <laughs> And you, 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 as I, unapolog- unapologetically a Steeler fan, I get it. But I, I, you're watching that game, and, and here's the thing about Lamar, and I've been saying this since the giant fuss was made over him as a rookie. If you play fantasy football, he's the greatest regular season quarterback you could possibly have. But in the playoffs, where video game numbers don't matter, he hasn't been the guy. And, and another season goes by where he still isn't. I think he'll get there someday. I, I do think he'll get the Ravens to the Super Bowl at some point. It's not there yet because he's still not ready. He's, I think he's getting there. But, but ultimately, at some point along the way, you have to stand in the pocket and make a play against really good defenses in the playoffs. And he's still not that guy yet. Dylan, you, you well, agree or disagree with that, Dylan? I I think to like he's not Mahomes. He might not even be Josh Allen. I think he's probably one of the next guys after that. I do think there are some things, some areas where he can be better. I do think it gets overblown a little bit because I think up to this point he was in an offense that just did him absolutely no favors. You had Greg Roman running the offense, calling plays, and had guys like Hollywood Brown as like his only reliable wide receiver outside. And even now. Even this year, they reworked the wide receiver room. I think the wide receivers were kind of overrated. 
Like Odell Beckham was not the old Odell Beckham. Rashad Bateman, I think, was misused a little bit too much as a deep threat when he should be a possession guy. And Zay Flowers is still a rookie. He's a, he's a really good rookie. Mm-hmm. But uh, he's not that like bona fide number one kind of guy that some of these other teams have. And, you know, Mark Andrews hurt. It's a little bit of stuff like that. I think there's still work around him to do on offense. But I do think that, yeah, he's not uh, – no one's Patrick Mahomes. But I don't think – I don't think it's all on him. I think he does – a good job i think he does do things like not scramble enough sometimes actually i think he sometimes doesn't run the ball enough like he doesn't take what the defense will give him when there's like not a quarterback spy in the middle of the field and things like that but overall i i I trust him i just need the to an extent you know i don't have the full-fledged mahomes can do nothing wrong sort of vibe with him but i'm not in this like i don't trust him sort of sort of way Billy well it's I mean Lamar Jackson's probably the most overall talented with his legs and his arm quarterback in the league I don't think there's any question about that he is a he may be the best running back in the league besides Christian McCaffrey and he seems like a super good guy he really does I've I've always come away with that impression that he's he's a good human being. He seems like a good teammate, but he's always going to. They're always going to view him as a running quarterback. And like you said, if he can't sit back there in games like that, bad weather, uh, defenses like, like Kansas City has this year. You know, we always think of Kansas City with the super offense this year. It's their defense. And, but like you said, if he can't sit back and pick teams apart. They're not going to get there, and I think that's why he has trouble against Pittsburgh. You know, he he has an abysmal record against Pittsburgh, and they just play him well. They make him sit back and pick pick them apart, and he he hasn't been able to do it. So, I, you know, at the end of the day, I feel bad for him. I do appreciate the way Baltimore plays and the way that they're ran, but I'm tickled to death that they lost. <laughs> <laughs> just made my day. That they lost. Well, uh, Dylan still wins the uh, the line of the day for it stays like this where John just travels this morning to stay in the room. Can't get his heart broken because he doesn't put it out there for sports or sports ball. Which is why do we sports do this ball, to ourselves? Yeah. <laughs> why do we do this to ourselves? Is they have no control over a bunch of people I never met. Why do they make or break my day? I don't know. That's a great question. We all seem to live it as sports fans here. Phil, let's talk some money, right? Let's do it. It's a big earnings week. Big earnings week here, Phil. Hey, uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Stubblefield, yeah. speaking of having his heart broke, Tesla, is, is Tesla a stock to dump and get the heck out of now, Phil? No, you certainly wouldn't dump it after it fell like it did last week. And we've seen that with Tesla. Tesla's very volatile. It goes up and down drastically, most of it based off perception, and most investors have a perception that Elon, whatever Elon Musk touches will turn to gold eventually. So uh, if you held Tesla – after last week, it's certainly not a time to, to dump it. Now you just kind of hang around and, and watch it grow again or hopefully watch it grow again. Last week was an interesting week, and we could see something like that again this week. Earnings wasn't the greatest. Now, there's a few companies that did well, but Tesla and Intel had a terrible earnings report. But our economic data and that, those, that data, those data points that we at one point thought good news is bad news has now become good news is good news because they're, they're in conjunction with inflation continuing to fall. The PCE number on Friday fell below 3% year on into 2.9%. So we, as investors, you look back and it's like, well, why do we want good news to be bad news? Because inflation, albeit slow, continues to drop. And now this week, it could be something similar. There's a lot of big companies reporting, and I want to say it's Microsoft and Amazon and Apple. So a lot of the big tech companies are reporting, but the Federal Reserve speaks on Wednesday. It's a foregone conclusion that they're not going to do anything. So just almost just like every time they speak, it's not what do they do, but what do they say? And will they give any indication on when rate cuts could begin? Now, there is support. There's a lot of support to say, hey, you guys can start doing this as early as March simply because inflation numbers have continued to slowly fall and the economic data looks good. But on the other side of that coin, you would say, well, if economic data looks good and inflation continues to drop, why would we cut interest rates? Why would we even do that for? 
And, of course, the answer is to, to curb off any bad economic data. But this week could look the same where uh, earnings reports and economic data or Federal Reserve comments kind of coincide and mix with each other. And then the output is who wins, which is more important. Last week it was a pretty decent week, so that tells us that the economic data was a little bit more important overall than what the company earnings were. Yeah, what? looking at Wall Street Journal uh, article, it said lowering taxes by uh, now will reduce the possibility of recession and having lower tax, lower rates. I'm sorry, lower rates uh, much larger in the future. So they're advocating that we'll probably be hearing uh, from the Fed uh, lowering the rates a little bit over the next few months. But let me go back to Elon yep. Musk very quickly. Uh, Elon Musk, when he wanted to buy uh, Twitter or uh, now X, uh, he sold or approximately one-third of his holdings uh, in order to get enough money to buy Twitter. Now he's coming back to the stockholders and saying, or shareholders, and saying, I, I need the control and interest back. Give me that money. Give me those shares that I had to sell earlier. And there's quite a bit of pushback among the shareholders and say, wait a minute, uh, what you did was on your own volition. We don't have to bail you out to enhance your uh, your portfolio. And I want to add to the Tesla story, just kind of an interesting anecdote. Um, I spent last week in Vegas at a conference and, I, you know, you Uber from one place to another. I'm not going to rent a car. And one of the Uber drivers was driving a Tesla. And I asked him what he thought of it. And he said, well, I used to like it. And I said, well, you know, what's going on? He said, I bought this. I don't know what the model was. I bought this model a year and a half ago for $55,000 and a buddy of mine bought it two years before that for $70,000 and now they're selling for $40,000 and he's upset that the value that the, um, the value placed on the vehicles continues to go down. So I guess my question to you, Bill, is as a, as a Tesla owner, is that concerning to you? And to Phil, is that a concern in terms of the Tesla stock overall? No, it's just for one model. And what they're trying to do is reduce the price in that one model to make it more affordable. Most of the other Tesla models have not gone down in price. Okay. Yeah, and I would say the same thing. You know, from a from an investment standpoint, I would say no, because they're trying to find the way into mainstream America. I actually think that's a pretty positive thing, because one of the one of the drawbacks when you looked at Tesla years ago was it wasn't affordable for most people. So you had to have a strong desire and the ability to pay for a, a Tesla and to protect your environment. So that used to be underneath the, the underlying reason was hey, protect your environment. But if they can get a price model that's in line with a, a gas vehicle of Chevy, Ford, GM, whatever it may be, where the mainstream America could buy it, then they, they would be willing to purchase it if it's just right for them. Forget the environment. Is this vehicle right for me from the standpoint of how much gas costs and, and the ease of parking? You know, I, go to, I see a lot of parking garages in our travels, and the easiest, park, the easiest way to park is to have an EV because you get that bottom row. Nobody else can park there. It's like you're a VIP. So some of those these little these little perks that you get from having an EV slash Tesla uh, is attractive to mainstream America. So I think it's really positive because now you've got a price point that most people, middle class people, could purchase with that one model. Now if you're if you're holding that Tesla, if you're in that Tesla, and what your Uber driver was upset about is he saying, hey, I paid 55 for it. Now they're selling it for 40 or 45 or whatever it may be. My resale value is nothing. Well, I would say from a financial standpoint, you probably shouldn't be buying a vehicle based off what you think its resale value should be. You would get the most money out of your vehicle at uh, if, you, if you drive it till the wheels fall off, as we used to say. Now, there's areas where you could sell your vehicle or trade your vehicle in that's most uh, prudent. But at the end of the day, the answer is always, if you can keep that sucker running for 400,000 miles, that's where you get your most money out of it, if you can keep it going like that. I think Rob's got like 4 billion miles on a Honda or something along those lines. 346,200 on my CRV, Philly. <laughs> that's how you get your money out yeah, of your baby. vehicle. That's exactly how you and, – and, and, and at that point, it doesn't matter what kind of vehicle it was or what its resale value is because if you're driving it at 346,000 miles – it does not cross Rob's mind how much he can get out of that. That's when you end up giving them to your kids or you donate them or do something along those lines because nobody's going to pay you a lot of money for even if it runs well. 
for something that's got 350,000 miles on it. So I think those moves by Tesla is, is a very strong and positive thing for future for investments in the future. I like the way you phrased that. And also like the way you talked about the VIP parking for Tesla. That was part of the Stubblefield clause when Bill agreed to buy one of these from Elon Musk, who he knows personally, by the way. They they play tennis and lunch together. Pickleball, pickleball. Pickleball is what it is. It's because you can't move as much now. Yeah. yeah. I think the next thing needs to be that there's a charging station at the at the physical address of WR&R, so when Bill pulls up, he can charge his vehicle up. Not a bad idea. A Let's talk to Hornby about That's that. That's a, a great idea, idea Phil. Actually, there's an That's intern out there with a little generator. <laughs> he sits out there with a pedal, you know, it's like a bicycle. Just yeah. keeps it. We, we could always use a 110, but I'd have to stay here much longer than Rob wants me to stay here. Take a long time with a 110 line. Hey, uh, Phil, yeah, price three, of oil has more treats in. <laughs> the price of oil has been inching up again. Where uh, this morning at one point it was over seventy-eight dollars a barrel once again. Uh, at some point along the way, does that start to become a concern again? Not at not at seventy eight dollars a barrel. If it gets to where it did a few years ago, or I guess it wasn't a few years ago, it wasn't a year 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 and a half ago, that where we were paying uh, it was up close to a hundred dollars a barrel. And we're paying five bucks a gallon for gas or close to it. Then that becomes a concern. But in in terms of, and I know I break everything down to the Federal Reserve, I, and and I know how infuriating that can be to some people. But the way that the Federal Reserve looks at the price of oil is it's temporary. Is there's an ebb and flow to it. That's why there's those core numbers that they look at with inflation, which trips out the, the price of more volatile energy and, and some food items. So, and that's what they're focused on. So from the standpoint of rate movements and, and inflation and long-term inflation, they really do strip that out until it becomes a long-term problem. Of course, prices will go up during summertime and during holiday seasons. And then you have your blips on the radar, radar with the – with OPEC and, and if they have cut supply and international tensions, but that typically goes away pretty quickly. So I, right now it, it may be out in the, in the distance where you would look at it, but right now it's not a concern. Amazon is terminating its move forward with acquiring the vacuum maker iRobot. iRobot, an exchange of that. The CEO has stepped down. They're laying off 31% of their workforce. And it's yet another company, Phil, associated with tech that is laying people off. As we saw the, the news last week, it seemed like every day another company was coming along with more layoffs. Is the market at this point looking at layoffs as a good thing or as a bad thing? Well, when you look at the overall, now you've got your sectors like tech that has struggled more in employment-wise anyway, that has struggled more than other sectors. When you look at the overall unemployment number it is still really good by the way that the federal reserve looks at it and what the way we're reading this and, and that's uh, back to that good news can be good news again there was a point where i was kind of secretly hoping I, I maybe not even secretly i said it out loud but if unemployment numbers would have crept up to like four and a half percent that, that would be really good for our markets because it would mean that the federal reserve needs to cut rates sooner rather than later but that never happened and inflation continued to come down that's kind of an anomaly when you see inflation come down it typically comes with poor or anyway consumer confidence and struggling uh, uh, employment numbers and that's what the federal reserve talked about that remember in august of 21 i think when drone Powell said we're going to have to see some pain and our markets just took a terrible fall and that's what he meant was seeing pain on the economic front, but it looks like we haven't seen that pain yet. It, it softened a little bit. Make no mistake, it softened some, but surprisingly enough, inflation continues to come down slowly, and it continues, but it, it still continues to come down without those poor economic numbers. And that's why there's so much hope out there and promise that we can actually achieve this soft landing. And you would have to make a public apology to drill pounds. That happens. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to stop because Bill put his index finger up. He wants to talk. Yeah, when that finger comes up, it trumps everything else. <laughs> he, was, he was just going to make the point that you have to apologize to drill pounds. Well, <laughs> That's right. No. Yeah. Uh, this past week, uh, Phil, uh, uh, Biden put a freeze on liquid natural gas terminals saying that until after the election. Uh, is that a strictly political uh, decision? decision or does it have economic overtones as well uh that's a good question that i can't answer i wasn't even aware that he had done that bill so yeah. 
to see uh, to see whether or not that would have any it, economically. No, probably not. Probably wouldn't have uh, in, any impact on our markets or what the Federal Reserve does. Uh, politically, I certainly wouldn't know because I, I have, other than listening to you guys, I have tuned out to some of this nonsense with what uh, leading up to our presidential election. So I, I wouldn't be a good person to answer that, and I apologize for it. So you're saying that we provide the unvarnished truth and no political yes. BS. That well said, Phil. Well yeah, said. I, I, I do. I do. I listen. I listen. I do. And Friday show, I was tuned in. I, I was tuned in because I don't know. Uh, on, from a national media standpoint, I always feel like I'm getting tricked, and I always feel like somebody's trying to sell me something, and so therefore I just don't listen. So I listen to you. Honestly, I listen to you guys, and and I listen to some of the points that you all make, and especially that Friday crew, and uh, that's where I get my 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 political. Uh, uh, political information to form my own opinion is from you all we need to have him on more often <laughs> speaking of getting <laughs> speaking of getting tricked phil the analytics community which took over baseball some time ago has worked its way into football and the an, and when you talk to the, the analytics community they make perfect sense out of what dan campbell did yesterday to detroit uh, whereas 100 years of common sense previously in professional football would have dictated that he kick a field goal on two different occasions. He went for it both times on fourth down, and I firmly believe as a result of that, Detroit is not in the Super Bowl this morning. I cringed for Dan Campbell because I became a fan of his and the Lions uh, to an extent during the Hard Knocks episode that featured them. It's the only Hard Knocks I've ever watched from start to finish, and uh, you could kind of see he was building something with the Lions. Uh, yesterday, I, I thought he just torpedoed his own team, man. Yeah, and, and, you know, Kurt Warner had a good take on that because, again, I was listening to it, so I didn't get to see it with my eyes, but I was listening. And Kurt Warner had mentioned those two field goals, and they, they, they talked about them a lot. And But he had a really good point that that's kind of how Detroit, that's how they're built, that's how they got there, and be who you are in the most critical moments, even if it doesn't work. And then apparently one of those fourth down conversions was just the receiver dropped the ball. And that's something that it would be difficult to blame Dan Campbell's decision making on just because the receiver dropped the ball. But the, you know, I would argue that there's a third time that they could have kicked a field goal, and they were over two minutes remaining in the game. They're down by ten, and they had all of their timeouts. Uh, I think there's an argument to be made to kick a field goal there, and then you have your four, full arsenal of timeouts, and if you get the ball back, you have plenty of time uh, to to engineer a drive down the field. But Having said that, that's kind of who they are, and I agree with you, though. Common sense told me I'm thinking, kick it, man, kick it, because you're, you're up. You're just going to add another time that San Francisco has to has to uh, score, and he didn't do that. But that's who he's been all season long, so I guess in those most critical moments, you have to be who you are. Phil, how do we reach you for more information today? You can reach us at 304-263-4343 or stop by and see us with an appointment at 1270 Winchester Avenue right here in Martinsburg. Thank you, Phil. Have a great day. Thank you, guys. Have a great week.